Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This does feel a little bit like church if you'd like to move forward. Okay, you can sit back there, but you'll have to answer questions. So good afternoon. I'm Andrea Kovacs, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Albertus, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our second annual Dominican Forum. Um, I also bring greetings from our president, Dr. Julia McNamara, who regrets that she's not able to be with us today. And I know that you are all looking forward to today's presentations on the Dominican tradition in action. I know that I am. I hope that we all come away feeling inspired with an idea for how we can each incorporate Dominican ideals into our daily lives, both at home and here on campus, and how we might inspire others to do the same. I want to point out something that I think is pretty significant. On this day in 2001, Apple introduced the iPod, okay, which completely changed the way we listen to, enjoy, and incorporate music into our daily lives. I mean, there were ways to do it before, but that iPod really changed the way music infiltrated every aspect of our 24 hours. I think that there's a similarity between the iPod, remember that was only 12 years ago, a lot has changed. There's a lot of similarity between the iPod and how it influenced or how it uh, helped us further enjoy our love of music and our Dominican heritage. Here on the Albertus campus, we may not have the Sisters of Peace walking from class to class in their habits as they did 50 years ago. But we still have the foundation of our Dominican heritage, study, prayer, community, and service. And what we have available to us are more and more opportunities to incorporate those principles into our daily lives, here, on campus, and at home, and to encourage other people to do the same. And I'm very excited to hear what our young people are going to tell us today about how they experienced all of this over the summer. We have different opportunities to experience and embrace our heritage, our Dominican heritage, so many new ways to access it and to incorporate it into our daily lives and to really live and enjoy it. That's what we're going to hear about today. So settle in, listen up, and be prepared to be inspired. Sister Ann. Andrea. Andrea is much taller than I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and special, special thanks to our participants for being willing to share their experiences with us today. They were wonderful experiences and you're going to get to hear from them and you're going to get to see about some of them visually. Um, as I, Andrea said, President McNamara um, sends her regrets um, she had a fall, broke her foot, and today is having surgery. So let's just take one little moment of silence to pray for healing and a speedy recovery. Thank you. I know she'll be grateful. Um, in addition, we want to thank um, President McNamara, the College, and the Dominican Sisters of Peace for their support in funding our attendance at some of these um, experiences that we're going to hear about this afternoon, both internationally and nationally. As we all know, we study in many ways, classwork, personal engagement, and experiences that broaden and shape in our lives. Today, our participants are going to talk about their study experiences, each uniquely different, but connected through the Dominican value of study. These opportunities and other study experiences can set each one of us on fire to see things differently and to desire to learn more. A real experience of Dominicans being on fire for the truth. This image of being on fire connected to Dominican study comes from our tradition of Dominic. And it goes back to an image of Dominic that is depicted in this picture that's up in front here, where you see a dog um, at his feet, 
with a burning torch in his mouth. And this painting, by the way, was done by Sister Thoma Swanson, who was a chair of the art department here for many years. Now, tradition says that Jane of Aza, Dominic's mother, while she was pregnant with Dominic, had a dream of a dog, like this one, that would hold a torch in its mouth and would set the world on fire. For Dominicans and those of us in Dominican institutions, this image reminds us how seeking the truth through study and sharing our knowledge with others can really set the world ablaze and make changes. It is our hope that participating in such programs as the Fanjo Study Program, the Semester at Sea, and the Dominican College Preaching Conference will inspire our participants from the college here to set the world ablaze and to bring change from their studies. We're going to begin with the Fanjo study experience. And this was, happened this summer in France. This international study program is for students, faculty, and staff of U U.S. Dominican colleges. Through the seminar, students, faculty, and staff explored history, the Dominican tradition, culture, theology, social justice, and art. Attending this study program in Fanjou from Albertus were Justin Sarasoli and Eliz McGarry. Justin is especially well known to all of the students as the director of residential life. Justin enjoys building connections with the resident students, and I know most of the time they're very happy to see him, but I'm sure there's days that they are not happy to see him, and also being a resource for them. His interests include reading, politics, reality TV, and spending time with his dog, who doesn't get to live on campus, by the way. Liz McGarry is a member of the class of 2014 with a major in marketing. Liz hopes to continue to do marketing in hockey after graduation. She also enjoys travel and reading. So Justin and Liz, we look forward to hearing from you. So. This, this summer, um, from the end of May to the mid of June, Liz and I had the opportunity to travel to Fanjou, France, as well as some neighboring cities in the southern part of France for this wonderful opportunity um, to represent Albertus Magnus College. As you can see, we were in a pretty good looking place. Um, this picture was actually taken from the backyard of the House of St. Dominic in Fanjou. So, thank you. So, we want to start off by telling you all exactly where is Fanjou in France. Because when I first heard Fanjou, I was thinking, oh, it's near Paris, because everything's near Paris. <laughs> well, as you can see, it's in the south of France. It's located in southwestern France and it's part of the Languedoc Roussillon region. And it's about an hour and a half to travel from Toulouse, which is one of the major cities in the southern France. And it has an approximate population of 760. So it is a very small commune in France. Okay, so who was there? Okay. Um, obviously we had Albertus Magnus College. We had several colleges, um, Dominican colleges from across the United States. Um, we had two colleges from Michigan and New York and California, Wisconsin, a little bit everywhere. In the top left corner is a photo of all of us. That's everybody that went on this trip. There's about 49, 50 of us. So, I mean, we were a pretty decent sized group, but in the bottom right is a picture of Justin and I that's actually looking out from Senadu, which we'll talk about later, but it's a very um, historically important place in Fanjou for the Dominican. So, why were we there? One of the reasons we were there was to learn about the Dominican tradition in the land of St. Dominic. Fanjou is the place where St. Dominic travel through during his time here with us on Earth in the early 13th century. We also were there to network and learn from similar Dominican institutions. There were nine institutions with us in addition to Albertus Magnus, so we had the opportunity to meet students, faculty, and staff from all ranges of administration, from vice presidents and deans, to support staff on the academic affairs department. So we were a good mix of people to learn from one another. And we also were there to visit and reflect on various locations that were important to the Dominican tradition, the founding of the order, as well as in French history. And the, the students that were there ranged from first year freshmen 
graduated seniors. And we basically were looking at medieval art and architecture and how that related to the Dominican tradition, because especially in this region, a lot of the art and architecture was made to portray the stories and the, um, the elements of the Dominican tradition. So people, when they went to church, it wasn't just the sermon or whenever the priest was saying, it was the entire building was a monument to the Dominican tradition. So we looked at that quite heavily. And for us faculty and staff members, through seminar and dialogue, we read a lot of readings written by uh, contemporary Dominicans about the four pillars, uh, a, a different interpretation of the four pillars in American higher education. It was also just a really big opportunity for us to share what our, our traditions on our own campuses and compare and contrast them with each other, garner new ideas, but also to see where we can improve on promoting the Dominican tradition on our very similar campuses throughout the United States. Um, one of the biggest things that we came away with was how similar we were, but yet how different. So that's what we did as faculty and staff, and we were able to join the students on their numerous field trips as well. So. One of the first locations we want to talk about with you all today is Senadu, which means sign of God. This is a location in Fanzhou, and it overlooks the beautiful countryside, um, which the first picture was taken from this location. And the picture's image here on the on what would be your left is just a statue of St. Dominic that stands at that location. And then the image on the right is a cross with um, a marble plaque to talk about the significance of what that location means. This is a very prominent location in Fanshawe for the Dominican tradition. Uh, fire also plays such a really big role. I know Sister Anne talked about it, um, but fire plays such a really big role in kind of like I, I want to say mythology, but that's not true. But like the the storytelling or the history of um, the Dominican tradition. So a lot of elements of different places that we went to had a lot to do with fire, and Sunday was obviously one of them. Was it similar to me? Okay, so this is um, Salon de Saint Dominique, which is the house of Saint Dominic. Um, these are actually pictures from inside. This was where Saint Dominic lived when he was alive, and also he turned it into a chapel, so people would go and pray. We actually got the chance to have our own um, service here, which was fantastic. Um, on the far, your far left is a statuette of Saint Dominic. In the center is actually clear glass, and you can see that there is a bone fragment that is believed to be a part of Saint Dominic. Um, so it's very sacred place with a lot of relics, and as you can see, um, the everything's original to how it was in, during St. Dominic's time, so it's, it's a very old place, it's very sacred, and actually in in this um, chapel was where St. Dominic and a Cathar priest were getting into a debate one day about who had the true word of God, and Dominic said, well, let's test it, let's see who has the true word of God. God would never let his own word burn, so if we throw both of our holy books into the fire, whoever's book does not burn has a true word of God. They did this. Um, St. Dominic's Bible actually flew out of the fire, hit a beam, and left a gigantic burn mark, and he knew that he had the true word of God. That beam is actually has been cut up and has been brought to several different places. Part of that beam is still in the house of St. Dominic, and then some of it is at, um, I don't know if this is going to look at later, the, um, the couvent, where the uh, the nuns actually lived, but it was a very moving place. It's a, it's such a testament to Saint Dominic and how these people really care for their Dominican traditions. So as I mentioned earlier, when talking about Saint Dieu, um, the location of Pruy, this is the monastery at Pruy. It's about a short walk from Fenichau downhill. Um, we were told it's a quick walk, about 25 minutes. It's more like 45. <laughs> um, but we walked to it, and as you can see, it's a very prominent monastery in the area. Um, it's been under construction and renovation for the last um, 100 or so years. It suffered a major fire in the 19th century. They're still um, rebuilding it. We had the opportunity to attend Vespers with the nuns who live at Pruy, um, which was a very eye-opening and very um, moving experience um, as we watched the nuns with um, their small congregation move through Vespers and it was entirely in French, which is always beautiful to listen to. Um, so it was a very moving experience just to see that um, the nuns still live um, in the Fletcher community and they still have their ministry in the community. You know, They have a gift shop with beautiful knickknacks and other beautiful items that they sell. 
to raise money for their renovation project of the monastery. Okay, so this is the Shrine of St. Dominic and the Miracle of the Book. The Miracle of the Book is what I was just talking about, with, um, having the true word of God and throwing their um, holy documents into the fire. This is actually at the Kuban, which is where all of the um, nuns actually live. This is around the back. They have this beautiful shrine with this hand, I believe mean, it's like a hand-carved statuette of St. Dominic. And they have, it has a, a beautiful um, Latin uh, tiled out the floor. I actually have no idea what it says. And if you can read it, feel free. <laughs> um, and there, there's another part of the beam to the side of the statue of St. Dominic. So, so that's what it's in addition to all the sites in Fanjo itself and the neighboring area of Krui that deals with Jamaican tradition, we also had the opportunity to go on a few day trips throughout the neighboring communities in southern France. Um, we chose a few to highlight with you today. Um, the first picture on the far left is at the Abbey de Francois. It is a monastery in France. Um, it's about two hours away from where we were staying. Um, and it was just a beautiful monastery that was commissioned and rebuilt with expansive gardens and cloisters. It was just a beautiful location to be. Um, and then on the right, we have um, the church at Nals. Um, this church is pretty cool because it is built into rock. Um, it's carved out of rock and then it built upwards. Um, we were able to go in there and there was some Dominican iconography inside as well. Um, and a lot of um, Fresco in the ceilings that have been well preserved over the last couple hundred years. Um. Okay, so a couple of the other ones were Carcassonne, which is a walled city. It's a fortified city. This was how, in the medieval times, like this is how a city would be set up. It would be walled in. So if you think about the city of New Haven, imagine right at the border of New Haven having massive walls. And this was, you only lived in your city, you very rarely left. This is something that for the, the students that were studying this medieval art and architecture, this was really important because not only is it showing how strong the Catholic faith is that you have to have these strong walls and you're fortified, but it's also to protect yourselves. Um, I mean, it wasn't a very pleasant time to live. People would steal and so people need to be protected, so that's why they had to put this on. Uh, the caves at Mir, these are uh, centuries old um, cave paintings. We actually got to travel up the mountain and go deep into inside of it. And you actually get to see these beautiful cave paintings that are centuries old. And it's, it's actually quite moving to, to be there. And by century, she means 14,000 years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember exactly how long, but I'm here. Um, so that was actually quite moving because it just showed you how old. I mean, we think of things here when we say that a building is 100 years old, where we're shocked that it's been around that long, but to see something that's been around for 1,500 years is, is phenomenal. And then there's also Collier, which is the southernmost point of France before you get to Spain. This was just this was just a beautiful day trip that we got to go. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea, so it's a very colorful seaside town. And it's beautiful, it's fantastic. Um, we also went to Albi, which is the seat of the Albigensian Crusade. Um, so we were there, we got to go into the cathedral there, the Cathedral of Saint Cecile. Um, this cathedral was massive, it um, was very ornately done. It took 200 years to build. Um, and you can see how big it is, and that picture is taken from a distance, but it was very towering when you stood next to it. Um, we went to Albi because, like I said, it was the seat of the Albigensian Crusade, which is very prominent for the, the history of the Dominican Order, but also um, in Albi, it also boasts one of the um, oldest working bridges in France. There is a Roman bridge dating back to um, 1000 AD that still stands and is operating today. And then on the right, it's Montségur. This is another prominent site when it comes to talking about the Cathars. Um, during the Albigensian Crusade and the purging of the Cathars, about 250 um, Cathars or Albigensians were led up this mountain um, by foot to the fortress at the top where they were held captive, and they were told essentially convert or meet your death. Um, about 250 Cathars were burned at the stake um, at the top of that mountain at Montségur. Um, Liz and I actually had the opportunity to visit that site and climb the mountain. 
Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that when we were walking up it was, wow, having to walk up probably a couple mm -hmm. miles up, uphill on rocks just to die. And you know, it's a very reflective experience to see, um, would you hold your beliefs in, a, in an experience like this? You know, it was actually a very moving um, opportunity for us. Um, it was also happened to be one of the hottest days that we were there. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's and then that's really all that we're going to talk about for the is you see this is a nice picture of Liz and I at the top of Mont Segur. Um, we do encourage questions. Um, we'll get to the question and answer portion because the experience was so magnificent and wonderful over three weeks that we couldn't possibly talk about everything with you today. But please ask us questions or stop by and see us. We'll be more than happy to tell you all about it. Thank you. Um, Justin and Liz, uh, thank you for sharing with us this wonderful opportunity to be where the Dominican vision began 800 years ago in Peru and took shape and the many opportunities you had to share this with uh, students, faculty, and staff from other Dominican colleges and to enjoy the richness and beauty of France. Our next speaker is Jeanette Gonzalez, who participated in the Semester at Sea program during the 2013 spring semester. Through this unique program, Jeanette had the opportunity to learn about many different cultures and countries from a diverse faculty located in many different parts of the world. Jeanette is a member of the class of 2014. Her major is Global Studies with minors in Communications and Art, all of which she sees in her future. Jeanette enjoys reading, art, yoga, and obviously travel. Jeanette. Hi, I am taller than Sister Anne, so. <laughs> um, so I have an actual speech, so I have to stand at a podium, so I'm not gonna be as close to my pictures. Um, but as the slide clearly states, this is about my voyage literally around the world. Um, so normally the first question I'm asked about my trip is, so, how was it? And as many of you have heard, I traveled around the world on a cruise ship. So the MV Explorer, which is the ship shown in the picture, was my home for 106 days uh, between January 9th and April 25th of this year. Sounds glamorous, right? Uh, well, there had to be one downside to the most influential experience of my life. Um, to be honest, the ship was really cramped. <laughs> Within these seven decks, which seem very spacious in this picture, we ate, slept, studied, and socialized. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, however, as you can see in these pictures, uh, transit between ports was actually extended to allow time for class. So we were aboard the ship up to 10 days at a time. 10 days at a time in this confined of a space. Yeah, it's a little tired. But enough of the complaining. Um, you're all here to hear about my wonderful adventures. So, yes, okay. Um, so as the map shows, my spring 2013 voyage began in San Diego, California. Um, where do I have to aim? Okay. So from there, we sailed to Hawaii. Yep. Then across the Pacific for 10 days to Japan. Then in rapid succession, if this will work with me, it'll work. We went to China, Vietnam and Cambodia, Singapore, and Burma. After a little lull in the Indian Ocean, we arrived in India. Um, so that entire thing happened about three weeks. <laughs> So at that point, the trip got very, very cramped and very tiring, but it was absolutely spectacular. Um, then after that, we had an eight hour stop in Mauritius. Um, then we continued to South Africa. From there, we sailed to Ghana and then on to Morocco. And finally, we docked in Spain. <laughs> if that seemed a little overwhelming, you just got a taste of four months of my life. Um, another question I'm commonly asked is what was my favorite part? 
much like what are you going to do with your life? The question covers too much time and too many possibilities. So to be honest, on a trip of this scale, I had no one favorite thing. From listening to Archbishop Desmond Tutu speak and laugh for three and a half months, to experiencing Japanese subcultures, to climbing a 1,500 foot, well, 1,500 meter mountain in Mauritius. So yes, I understand the climbing a mountain <laughs> thing. We understand each other. Um, to riding a full grown ele bull elephant in South Africa. FYI, once you stop feeding them, they don't like you anymore. Um, to seeing the majesty of the Hassan II Mosque. And similar to the church that he was talking about, this is the second largest mosque in the world. So there is literally no building I have ever seen anywhere else in the world that is this size. Because not only is it, well, I don't know what that is. So this is the interior of it. Um, so you can't really see how big it is, but, um, it has like a retractable roof, like a football stadium would. And then beneath it, there is a whole other maze of baths and um, spaces used to pray in Muslim tradition because you're supposed to cleanse the body to be able to pray. So there's a whole other section underground beneath this of baths and bathrooms to help with that. So to be honest, there's not one experience that I can pick to say that was my favorite. <laughs> um, so honestly, these just scratch the surface. But most importantly, on this trip, I learned. I learned about culture. I learned about food. Very interesting food. <laughs> Tarantulas in Cambodia are fried and served to you by little girls who have living ones crawling on them. That was a bathroom stop in the middle of Cambodia. No, don't eat the tarantulas. Um, politics. So um, I actually, like I said, I got to go to Burma, which is now closed again for um, cultural wars. And um, unlike the picture that you saw, which is very pretty and majestic, the cities, especially in Rangoon, which is um, the main city, is literally post-apocalyptic. Like, there is no way for me to explain to you how dichotomous this country is. Like, it has these touristic, beautiful sceneries where you can enjoy your time, and then it has these terrible, rundown cities where there's millions of people packed in and, and trying to struggle to get electricity and food and water. And then um, we also learned about service um, on the trip. Um, if you chose to do trips held by Semester at Sea, you actually got to go to orphanages and um, do different service projects. Like, uh, I think one group um, helped like cultivate a garden in one of the countries, and I cannot remember which one specifically. But and um, the most important thing that I learned was the reality of most people's state of living. Um, we are very, very fortunate in the United States. And this trip completely confirmed that notion. Um, the fact that we have roads, the fact that we have sidewalks, um, something as simple as plumbing or a toilet. Um, we had a joke on the chip about squatty potties. They are literally holes in the ground. And since there's not many students here, most of the adults, if they've traveled, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they're very scary looking holes in the ground in which you are expected to squat and do your business. It is awkward. Um, <laughs> and other things like um, good cooking places. Um, some of the restaurants that we went to were considered high class and there was cockroaches crawling around and they were normal. The bugs were normal. The 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 other living beings that made home in these kitchens and these restaurants was normal. Um, but then 
you got to other countries like, for example, China and Japan, and they far surpassed anything that you could imagine. Like, I mean, they had heated toilet seats, and that sounds really weird, but when your toilet can do more than flush, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, also, if I can manage to go back. Nope, never mind. Um, can you go back to the Japan picture? So that would be slide number. Mm. Ah, excellent. Oh, I didn't. Okay. So um, in Japan, high fashion is the norm. And um, actually, these women are um, the saleswomen, but they're dressed in their fashion. But the comment I actually wanted to make was based on another picture, which is actually the one I gave to From the Hill, not this presentation, um, is these huge monolithic buildings. Um, and it's of the Sega store. And for anybody who video games, Sega is one of the original major video game developers. And these are stores that challenge Mall of America and the Empire State Building. I mean, they're not that tall, but they're that expansive. It literally looks like New York City um, in, in video game world. And um, Singapore was also amazing and completely opposite of what I was imagining because, I mean, I've only ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> so I saw desolate swamplands and like really creepy looking people. And actually it is the New York City of Southeast Asia other than Japan. Um, they have gorgeous botanical gardens where they have these um, what are called super trees and you can see these from port all the way through. Mind you, Singapore is about the size of Manhattan, the entire country. Um, so there's these giant monolithic trees that are built to clean the carbon dioxide from the air using both natural plants that grow on the sides and uh, machinery, machinery within the actual structures that is meant to clean up all the um, pollution that comes out of Malaysia, which is a very poor country and has a lot of um, labor intensive factories that produce a lot of pollution. Um, so if we could go back to my last slide, please. Now I'll discuss my final points. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave you with a few ideas on how I choose to live my life now. Um, travel. Whether out of the state or out of the country, um, always be willing to experience something outside of your community. Um, what I've experienced a lot when talking about this experience of my life is that students look at me and they're like, oh, I could never do that. You, you, you have money, you can do that. And when I say that you travel, I mean get out of the state, get out of the city of New Haven. Don't think that you have to travel literally around the world to experience different cultures. You just need to get out of your comfort zone. If you live in inner city New Haven, go to Wallingford, go to Boston, go to New York, go to somewhere where the socioeconomic status isn't the same as yours. Go to a museum that talks about a different culture than yours. It's not just get on a ship, travel the world, spend however much money, which I don't feel comfortable sharing but <laughs> that I did on the trip. Spend 20 bucks. The train down to New York City is $13 from the New, Year New Haven station. Walk around the city for a little while. So that's, that's what I mean by travel. Just get out of your comfort zone. Um, personally, now at the age of 22, I've actually traveled to 23 countries around the world on top of the including the 13 countries I went to during this trip. Um, the second thing is to push your boundaries. Do not allow someone to tell you you can't do that or that's not an option for you. Yeah, finances is a problem and for every person it's going to be different how you experience your boundaries. But I can personally attest that working towards the impossible is worth it. Um, this trip, even for me personally, was very difficult. There's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of loops to jump through, but I worked for it, I pushed for it. 
I spoke to many a professor here and said, I want to do this. I want to get on a ship and travel for four months. And I worked with the staff and the professors here at the school and I got the trip. Um, in other words, if there's an opportunity, an event or a project that you want to do, work for it. Um, now, this is the most important one for me. It's to be thankful. Um, before this trip, even I consider myself narrow-minded. Um, though my mother made me an extremely well-rounded person, I realize now more of the benefits that my life has had contrary to what I believed before. Um, I was aware there was widespread poverty. I mean, we've all seen the commercials on TV of here, donate a dollar and you can feed an African child. FYI, most of that money goes to the commercials, not to the kids. Um, but now after physically seeing it, physically experiencing it and talking to those kids and talking to the adults and the teachers who are responsible for taking care of them, um, I can honestly say that I'm blessed and not just me, but everybody from every socioeconomic status in the United States is blessed. Um, so please take time to enjoy our surroundings and um, thank you all for your attention and the Q&A is at the end of the forum and I would be more than happy to take questions. Jeanette, thank you for sharing this wonderful and unique opportunity. You have been to more countries than many people get to in a whole lifetime. So that's a wonderful gift and opportunity you've had. And I know that these firsthand experiences of being part of so many different countries and cultures um, has made you look at the world differently, plus your own life differently. Our next presenters attended the Dominican College Preaching Conference at Malloy College in New York. The Dominican College Preaching Conference is offered each year for students and mentors from United States Dominican Colleges to meet and experience the Dominican tradition through shared study, prayer, community, and service experiences. Those who attended the 2013 conference were Gilmary Gonzalez, Mimi Matima, Leanna Velez, and Stephanie Seslar, who was their mentor. Gilmary, uh, who would be the class of 2015, is not able to be here. Currently, she's attending Tunxis Community College, but she hopes to return to Alberta's next semester. Mimi Matima is a member of the class of 2014. Mimi's major is social work with a minor in business. Mimi hopes someday to work for the United Nations, and I believe she will. Outside of a busy schedule, Mimi enjoys music, food, and fashion. Leanna Velez is a member of the class of 2015. Leanna's major is art management. Her career goal is to own her own art gallery. We'll all come and visit. <laughs> Leanna's interests are playing volleyball and being part of the Albertus Magnus College community where she is involved in many areas of college life. You see her all over the place. Accompanying the students to the preaching conference was Stephanie Seslar. Stephanie is Director of Alumni Relations for the college. One thing she likes about what she does, she loves future alumni, and certainly her creativity and enthusiasm are an asset to the Student Alumni Association. An interest Stephanie has is hiking with her awesome four-year-old brindle boxer, Bruce. Now let us see and listen to the experiences of the Dominican College Preaching Conference. Thank you, Sister Anne. While Justin and Liz and Jeanette shared with you the lovely landscape of our world, we are going to share with you our experience on beautiful Long Island, which was actually a really fantastic opportunity for us, and it was hosted, the Dominican College Preaching Conference was hosted at Malloy College, and Leanna is going to begin by telling you about our adventure. Hi. So, we went to the Dominican Preaching in Action Conference this summer, which was held at Malloy College, and there was a total of 12 Dominican colleges and universities. Um, and that's a picture of all of us. Um, just to tell
touch on, um, as Sister Ann mentioned, uh, the four pillars of the Dominican tradition. One of them was study, which um, we were able to, through an uh, interactive um, performance, we were able to learn about the saints, uh, such as Catherine of Siena, St. Dominic, and Mary Magdalene. And that is a picture of uh, a group of us, and in the, in the center is um, um, a sister uh, demonstrating and acting out, um, giving us a, an on experience of um, what it was like. What, what the the saint what the saint would um, talk about and, and that was really fascinating. Um, and the picture in the middle is um, Nancy Murray. She's going to be here January thirtieth to talk about a, a one woman play about Dorothy Stang. And I suggest you guys all go. It's at five fifteen because she is wonderful. Like she'll make you laugh for days. Like she's really great, and I'm sure you guys will enjoy her play. Now, um, just, just starting off with prayer and spirit, um, while we were at the conference, we had we uh, attended morning prayer and evening prayer, and um, this was really uh, unique and, and interesting because it was, um, you know, all the, the 12 universities and colleges came together and we were able to join in, in prayer where um, we were split up in groups and then each group had the opportunity to lead the morning prayer or evening prayer. And um, on the far left is um, a picture of myself with my group where I um, presented a prayer in Swahili, which is my native language. And also on the picture with the left was a shield where we all put our individual names to show basically community and we didn't put our school's name, we put our individual names to show that we came together as one. And the picture on the right is interfaith singing and dancing with Brother Joe. And we basically did singing and dancing and holding each other's hands, which brought us together as one community. And it made us become one with God as a whole unit instead of individually, which was, it felt more powerful to be there. Um, once again, with community, um, we went to the UN as a day trip to New York on the left, and we heard Sister Margaret Mace talk about the Dominican sisters' role in global community and how they're going to make the world a better place. And once again, that's Sister Nancy Murray on the right. And I think the reason why I enjoyed this so much is because I was able to personally connect to this coming as an immigrant, and my family coming here as an immigrant, um, I I shared a lot of what um, they, they were sharing with me, and we were able to um, talk and, and um, discuss about what the difficulties of what it is to be an immigrant and um, kind of living leaving your um, your homeland your home place and coming to a new country and embracing all the different cultures and. Um, opportunities. So I, I personally enjoyed this this part of the um, the trip. Um, my favorite part of the trip as well was our service, and I work in a local soup kitchen, and it really brought in my eyes to some poverty we have here, and it was crazy because um, during dinner times they would have a closet where they would stack a ton of clothes on shelves and shoes and a group of people would get set in and they would literally have two minutes to pick up whatever they wanted to take. It could be shoes, it could be pants, belts, scarves, anything they wanted, they had two minutes to take and it could only fit in a bag. And if it didn't fit in a bag, you had to leave it. Which I felt bad most of the time, like your two minutes are up. Like it was a tough job telling somebody like, two minutes are up, you can't take that. And it was crazy. And then sometimes, like as I'm waiting for the two minutes, there'd be little kids running around, and I would help them pick out games and stuff. And they're like, "Mommy, can I take this?" I was like, "You don't need to ask your mom. Just go ahead and take it." And it was just so cute. And it was a very powerful experience seeing people who really needed help and people who really wanted to help them. I visited the De La Salle School for young boys, grades five through eight. It was a, it's a very high risk 
low income population. There was a very long waiting list for this particular school. And what the students and I did was visit the each grade in their classroom and just talk to them about what it means to be in college as all of the students that I were with were obviously enrolled in colleges. And, and they talked to them about what a major is and what of course a study is and what it means to go to college and, and what they should strive for in the future. One of the most impressive things about this particular school is that as the students come in in the morning, the headmaster, along with all of the other teachers, stand at the door and greet each young man as they come in by shaking hands with them. And the same thing happens at the end of the day. And it's an absolutely amazing thing to see. Each young boy look someone, including myself and the other visitors, in the eye and shake their hand and say, good morning, hello, how are you? And the same thing at the end of the day. The ultimate goal of this particular school is to create gentlemen. And I think that that was a really powerful experience, not just for myself, but for the other college students who probably don't greet many of their professors with a handshake and looking them in the eye. So it was a really excellent opportunity. And, and certainly regarding service, I think many of you are aware of the 1925 hours of service that Albertus is engaged in right now. And, having started this in the summer and working with the students, we're all really committed to having these experiences ourselves and with the students. So that was a really good jump start to the project. So this quote is something that was in the program book from the preaching conference. It said they left from there and began a journey. And this certainly was a journey for all of us, considering none of us sitting here were heavily involved in campus ministry or really privy to the Dominican tradition prior to going to the conference. Justin and Liz had a, a very interesting opportunity to examine the roots of the Dominican tradition, and I think we all got to see the Dominican tradition today and how we are preachers. We were referred to as preachers throughout the conference, and I think at first that was a very confusing, kind of strange thing for us, thinking that preaching could be a long sermon or something very complicated and very religious, but really we learned at the preaching conference that preaching is is living a good life and is is being compelled to act when you hear something or when you see something that you just cannot ignore and i think that we all became very comfortable with being called the albertus preachers by the end of the conference and that was that was really transformational i think for all of us and we're really grateful to have had that experience to get to understand the dominican tradition and how we are a part of a much larger community of dominican colleges across the country and and the world and liana actually made very good friends with the ladies that they stayed with from puerto rico i don't know if you just want to share yeah so basically okay everyone there that conference was very welcoming um we had sister Sister Jenna, I, I get her name confused all <laughs> Sister Jenna, who, as soon as we got there, as soon as we arrived and we pulled there and we stepped out of the car, she actually gave us a hug. And that was very a very different experience because I'm not used to, like, it's the first time I met you, I don't really know you, hi. But by the end, I just got really used to it. Like, I felt the love and the warmth from my fellow Dominicans, and it was a great experience. And for my roommates, we had a suite. So it was me, Mimi, Gil, and we had three girls from Puerto Rico. And this summer, I go every summer to visit my family in Puerto Rico, and I actually got the chance to meet up with them. And we went to the beach, and it felt like that community we made that day at Malloy College was still there when I went to Puerto Rico. And there's all the time, we have a Facebook page for the Dominican preachers, and everybody's always saying like, oh, I miss you guys, I miss everyone, and it's just so nice to have that community that I never even expected to have. And I think um, overall the best part about it was just um, being part of a community and feeling welcomed and, um, you know, it, it, was, it was just nice to have that, you know, that feeling and to be, you, you're just, you, coming, going there, you didn't know anyone, and then leaving, you feel like you made uh, really good friends and um, th that you still keep in touch with. So that was that was a really um, nice part about being there. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Stephanie, Diana, and Mimi 
for sharing uh, with us your experiences at the preaching conference. You certainly uh, lived those four values of study, prayer, uh, community, and service, and you can just see in the way that you speak about them that they're part of you now. Um, we don't have a few minutes for comments and questions, so, um, but they will be around here for a few minutes after, so if anyone has anything they would like to ask, or anything that they would like to comment on, um, they'll be here, and then there's also plenty of lunch. And I, uh, on behalf of all those who participated in these programs, again want to thank uh, President McNamara, the college, and the Dominican Sisters of Peace who helped us support these programs. And I also want to thank Andrea Kovacs and the Advancement Office for sponsoring this program this afternoon, and for Karen to keeping the slides in order. I also want to thank you for attending and giving support to these activities that um, enrich our own history and our own tradition at the college. And particularly thanks to those who gave their presentations today. It's one thing to experience something, it's another thing to get up and have to talk about it. So you all did a wonderful job and we're most grateful for that. I think that all of them had opportunities to open their minds and hearts to different ways of being human through being attentive to the experiences they had and to see the world they live in through the lives of other people they met along the way. Thomas Aquinas has said, we are travelers for the truth, happy to receive a little bit of illumination from everyone whom we meet on the road. And I think that was their experience. We hope that some of you will avail yourselves of future opportunities to set your fire aflame through one of these opportunities. The Dominican Volunteers will be here again in January or February to speak with interested students graduating from college. And Jenna Fleming, coordinator of the Dominican College Preaching Conference and Dominican Young Adults, will be here this coming Tuesday on October 29th to speak about the Dominican College Preaching Conference. And she'll be offering information sessions at 1015 and 1115 in the Being Community Room. And again, thank you all, and let the Dominican tradition of the pursuit of truth set all of us aflame, as Dominic would say. Thanks again. Have lunch if you didn't have it yet. And remember to come up and ask them questions, because they're all prepared. <laughs>